Imagine your favorite team has the ball on first and 10. They throw a quick pass and the receiver gets tackled just around the first down marker. The referees spot the ball and then huddle together to make a decision on whether or not to grant a first down. At that moment, what decision as a fan are you hoping for? I would bet for most fans, it isn't a hard decision. You always want the first down, right? Well, if it were my team, I'd be hoping that the refs decide not to give my team the first down. This might seem crazy at first, but in this video, we'll dive into the data and see why second and one has many benefits that in my opinion, make it better than first and 10. One intuitive explanation of why second and one is so great is that it can be thought of as somewhat of a free play. Everyone loves when they can get the defense to jump offside and have a free play where you can just lob the ball deep. Second and one isn't exactly a free play like that is, but it does have some similarities. While turnovers and sacks can get you in trouble, incompletions or other net zero plays are relatively harmless. Over the past five seasons, there have been 3,527 second and ones. Of those sequences, 3,201 resulted in either a first down or a touchdown on second, third, or fourth down, meaning there was around a 90% chance of teams getting a first down at some point on second and one. If a team does not gain or lose yards on second and one and gets to third and one, the chances of a first down on this sequence drop to around 78%, and in reality are slightly higher since in this calculation field goals and punts are counted as non-first downs. If teams were committed to going for it on fourth down, the first down percentage would be even higher. 78% is still a fairly high chance of getting a first down, so while second and one is not exactly a free play, if it results in an incompletion or other net zero play, your team is still very likely to eventually move the chains and get a first down. On the other hand, on first and 10, teams historically have around a 72% chance of getting a first down on the sequence. If first and 10 turns into second and 10, that percentage drops all the way to around 58%. On second and one, if your play goes wrong, you still have a very high chance of getting a first down, but on first and 10, you don't really have that luxury with it being closer to a coin flip whether or not you get a first down if you don't gain yards on the first one. You may not yet be entirely convinced that second and one is better than first and 10, and you probably shouldn't be. After all, what happens if on second and one you take a sack or even worse, turn the ball over? The calculations we've done so far don't account for all the various possibilities of the play. In order to do this, we should expand our view from just the individual sequence to the drive as a whole. Imagine there are two situations, situation A and situation B. Both are at the opponent's 25 yard line, but we don't know what the down and distance are. Now imagine we had 100 data points for each situation that tell us what the outcome of the drive is. For situation A, there were 70 touchdowns, 25 field goals, and 5 turnovers. For situation B, there were 30 touchdowns, 60 field goals, and 10 turnovers. Looking at this data, we'd be pretty confident that situation A is a better situation to be in than situation B. This data was made up, but we can use the same principles to compare second and one and first and ten using real data. Over the past five seasons, there have been 716 first and tens at the 25 yard line. Excluding drives in which time ran out, such as end of half and end of game drives, there were 696 plays. Of these plays, 253 were from drives resulting in field goals, and 318 were from drives resulting in a touchdown. For second and one at the 25, there were fewer plays since it's a rarer down and distance than first and 10. Over the past five seasons, there were 44 second and one plays at the 25 yard line. Excluding four end of half situations, there were 40 plays in which the offense had time and was trying to score. Of these 40, 11 of the plays were from drives that resulted in a field goal, and 22 were from drives that resulted in a touchdown. Just by looking at these two situations, it is not as obvious as before which one is the better situation, especially since the sample size is so different. To better compare the two situations, one thing we can do is try to estimate what the average number of points scored is. To do this, we can assign a value of 3 to field goals, 7 to touchdowns, and 0 to any other result. For first and 10, there were 253 field goals, so we multiply that by 3, add to that 318 touchdowns times 7, and then divide by the total number of plays to get an average points of around 4.29. Repeating this for second and one, we get an average point scored of around 4.68, a little higher than the average points for first and 10. 
If you pay attention to NFL analytics, you may have heard of terms like expected points or expected points added before. Expected points is a metric that, like the name suggests, quantifies over the long run how many points a team are expected to score on average. And expected points added is when you simply compare expected points in two different spots to see the effect of a play. In essence, the calculations we just did are a rough version of what expected points is. However, the expected points models typically used in the NFL are a little more complex than just looking at how many touchdowns and field goals were scored in the past. In addition to considering these, the models also take into account additional variables such as time remaining and home field advantage, and they also account for situations in which the defense is more likely to score next. For example, if a team has fourth down on their own goal line, their expected points is going to be negative since the defense is more likely to get the next points than they are. We can use the more advanced expected points metric to better compare second and one and first and ten. To do this, we can look at all the plays at each yard line, calculate the average expected points, and compare the averages for second and ones and first and tens. Doing this, we get 81 yard lines where we can compare the two down and distances since you can't have first and ten inside the opponent's ten yard line, and you can't have second and one inside your own 10 yard line. Of these 81 comparisons, 77 of them had second and one having more expected points, with the average difference being 0.19. In the beginning of the video, I mentioned that I would rather be a yard short and have second and one than to get the first down and have first and 10. The comparisons we just did don't exactly measure this situation since they are comparing second and one and first and 10 at the same yard lines. To see if being a yard short really is worth doing, we should compare first and 10 with second and one at one yard behind. Doing this, we get that in 68 out of 80 possible yard lines, second and one has higher expected points with the average difference being 0.13. The one yard difference does seem to make the two situations closer, but it still seems pretty clear that second and one is the better spot to be in. So we've shown that second and one is a great spot to be in, but how should teams act to fully take advantage of the situation? Different teams seem to have varying philosophies on how they want to act on 2nd and 1. Last season, some teams like the Chiefs, Saints, and Jets had a balanced approach with 50% of their 2nd and 1s being passes and the other half being runs. On the other hand, teams like the Commanders, Chargers, and the Bills were extremely run heavy and only passed a few times out of all of the 2nd and 1s they were in. Interestingly, 50% passing was the maximum, so no team passed more than they ran on 2nd and 1. So which strategy is the best? Is there any relationship between how often a team passes and what their average yards gained on 2nd and 1 is? Plotting average yards gained against how often the team passes shows that there really isn't much correlation between the two. However, there are two teams that stand out from the rest in terms of their success on 2nd and 1. The Lions and the Colts both averaged more than 7 yards on 2nd and 1, while no other team averaged more than 5. To find out what the Lions and Colts did differently than everyone else, I investigated the data further. Starting with the Lions, their 2nd and 1 success comes from two main factors. Their offense being very good, and them not treating 2nd and 1 as a special short yardage down. As a baseline, I calculated the average yards gained for each team across all of their 1st and 10 plays. 30 out of the 32 teams averaged less yards gained on 2nd and 1 than they did on 1st and 10. However, the Lions averaged 0.7 yards more on 2nd and 1 than 1st and 10. This combined with their 1st and 10 average gain being a league leading 6.9 yards gained resulted in them being one of the two outliers in terms of 2nd and 1 success. The other outlier, the Indianapolis Colts, did not have the same level of dominant offense as the Lions. Their average first down yards gained of 5.9 was still very good, but it was 1.7 yards less than they averaged on 2nd and 1, which indicates that they might be treating that situation with a different strategy. I looked closer at all of the Colts 2nd and 1 plays last season, and the strategy was fairly easy to see. During the 2024 season, the Colts had 17 2nd and 1 plays. Of these, 12 were runs. These run plays had an average gain of 2.7 yards. Not terrible, but nowhere near the 7.6 average gain across all of their 2nd and 1 plays. So what were these 5 remaining plays that brought up the average so much? Well put simply, when the Colts passed on 2nd and 1, they went deep. Their 5 pass plays were 1 short pass for a 2 yard gain, 1 medium length pass for a 17 yard gain, and then 3 deep shots, 
One of them was incomplete, but the other two were completed for 39 and 40 yards gained respectively. These big plays were enough to bring up the average significantly, even though most of the Colts' second and one plays were fairly mediocre rushes. The Colts' pass plays on second and one had 21 average air yards, by far the most of any team on second and one passes. So if I was an NFL coach, what strategy would I use to get the most out of second and ones? Firstly, I would be trying to get into a second and one situation as often as I can. I wouldn't tell my players to always go down after gaining 9 yards because while 2nd and 1 is better than 1st and 10 a yard ahead, it certainly isn't better than 1st and 10 20 yards ahead. However, there are times when a player is running towards the sideline close to the 1st down marker. In situations like this, I would tell my team to not extend the ball to try to get the 1st down since 2nd and 1 can be so valuable. Once my team is in 2nd and 1, I would try to go deep as often as I can. You can't do it every time because you become predictable, but I would run a balance of offensive plays similar to what I would do on first and 10, with a few more deep shots thrown in. Turnovers and sacks can still be very costly, so I would also tell my quarterback that incompletions are perfectly okay if you don't like what you see. This obviously depends on defensive tendencies as well, but ideally teams on second and one should run an offense such that the defense has to be prepared for all possibilities instead of just being prepared for a run or a short pass. If treated correctly, 2nd and 1 can be a great opportunity for teams to try and get an explosive play with relatively low risk. So next time your team just barely misses getting 10 yards on 1st down, don't be disappointed but be excited for the possibility that might come next. Thank you for watching, if you enjoyed this video please consider liking and subscribing, until next time, peace.